Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm going to be talking about carriers in Star Trek. This is something that I really should have covered quite a long time ago, but just never got round to. Uh, I've covered fighters plenty, but I haven't covered carriers. Also, as it is by coincidence, an artist who has done a lot of work for me in the past, this channel would not be where it is today were it not for her help. That is Rizel Chan. She has done a whole load of Cardassian 3D models, which are available for free on her DeviantArt page. So follow the link below if you want to get a hold of Vasads, Galors, Echors, Keldons, Sartans, Leggets, whatever you want, she's got them. So definitely take a look at her, her art page because they're exceptional ships and they are excellent. And I'm really excited to present the 3D model for the Tornen class. The Tornen class previously only actually existed as a 2D illustration and has now been made into a full 3D model thanks to the tireless and exceptional work of Rizel 3D. So if you want a closer look at the Tornen, absolutely go look at her page. And she's actually come out with a couple of original designs which are quite interesting, which I might touch on in other videos. With that all out the way, let's get right into it. So. In order to approach carriers in the world of Star Trek, I think it's worth going back to the origins of carriers in the Star Trek universe, or at least the first modern carriers in the Federation. And that brings us back to the Harcourt class. Now, those of you who know your early Starfleet lore will know that the Harcourt class was a very important starship design. It was actually designed by the Vulcans and Denobulans, and the intention was to provide a colony ship that was capable of transporting and landing colonists on planets and providing the necessary logistical support in order to, in, in order to set up colonies. This was especially important for planets of the old United Earth, many of which had been devastated by the Romulans during the Romulan Earth War and so had to be repopulated. And so really it's worth saying with the Harcourt class, while it very much was a carrier, it was really a colonial carrier, not a military carrier. It is more of a utility carrier. It doesn't really have a military function because, well for starters, the craft that it could carry at the time weren't really very viable in any military sense, but they had various utility applications, so personnel shuttles, cargo shuttles, so on and so forth. So really actually, in terms of comparing them to anything from the modern day, the best thing to compare the Harcourt to is actually to helicopter carriers, which is quite interesting. A helicopter carrier has an awful lot of applications and is arguably more flexible. You have to be an awful lot more cautious with your aircraft carrier as compared to a helicopter carrier. The Harcourt itself has one large launch bay, and I mean large, that's a big gaping moor. So it's uh, it's quite an unusual looking ship in that respect, but it's a very capacious shuttle bay, allowing it to carry 12 shuttle pods and four cargo shuttles. The shuttle pods are the same ones as on the NX class, cargo shuttles are a little bit bigger, about 10 meters long. This kind of use of the Harcourt means that it stays in service for quite a long time because it's a fairly timeless application and is only really genuinely supplanted by the Geronimo class, which is a four years warship. The Geronimo class sees a substantial step up in every single area. The Geronimo class has two shuttle bays, which gives it an awful lot more flexibility in terms of simultaneously launching and recovering shuttlecraft. It has 16 shuttle pods, and these are different kinds of shuttle pods, and it also has eight large cargo shuttles, and these are much bigger than the previous generation. Now, it is fundamentally focused on engineering and utility. It has dual reactors, and this makes it a very impressive engineering platform. It can haul large stellar objects or bits of station. And again, you've got those two large shell bays, so it could carry a lot of work bees and construction drones. The Geronimo class would be very, very useful in terms of setting up space infrastructure in order to support growing colonies. However, it also had some quite impressive tactical capabilities. 
Because of its dual reactor system, it had far greater power levels going through its weapon system, and this means that its phasers, all four of them, hit incredibly hard. Harder than any other Starfleet ship of the time. Now, it only has four of them, and they have a relatively low rate of fire, but when it hits, it hits like a ton of bricks. But that isn't actually the main tactical application of the Geronimo class. That's not why it was so important in the Four Years' War. Why the Geronimo class was important in the Four Years' War is those 16 shuttle pods. Now, these are not capable of actually engaging an enemy starship in any meaningful way. What they are very good at is extending the awareness of the Geronimo and any ships in its vicinity and giving them a little bit of early warning and heads up in the event of an enemy attack. And when you're dealing with the Klingons, who are very, very mobile and very, very aggressive and very good at, you know, seizing the initiative, using the element of surprise, actually using these shuttle pods to extend your awareness and give you that time to prepare a counterattack, that was very important in the early phases of the Four Years' War, and that's what kept some battle groups alive. Battle groups that had the Geronimo survived. Battle groups that didn't use the Geronimo died, because the Klingons were able to outmaneuver them and they weren't able to see it coming. It allowed the battle group superior awareness and gave them a little bit of early warning. And this is really where we can see the evolution of what we'll call the proto well, we can call it a proto-carrier, or more specifically, I would call this a support carrier. The Geronimo is not meant to partake in direct combat. It is meant to support the other ships around it through the use of its auxiliary craft, but it itself is not meant to partake in combat. It can hit hard if it really has to, but it does not want to, because left out on its own, it's very slow, it's not very maneuverable, the Klingons will just tear it apart. But that does now bring us to the next kind of category, and that is what we will call battle carriers. Again, the proto-battle carrier to talk about here is the Constellation class. Now, in fairness, the Constellation does not start out as a battle carrier. It starts out as a utility carrier, but it could be recast as a battle carrier. Fighters in that kind of period were beginning to appear, but they were still very much... They were very much ground attack craft, they were not intended to engage starships, that was still very much not in their mission profile, they were mostly intended for ground attack. So in that way actually, the constellation also gives us a look at what we would call assault carriers, things like the Keldon, or indeed the Klingon uh, D-10, that's another example of an assault carrier, something that is, you know, carrying auxiliary craft but very much focused on supporting planetary landings and able to itself punch through defenses it has its own it has enough firepower to punch through fortified enemy positions in space and then provide that heavy fire support to the troops that it is landing on the ground so we can kind of see a, a, a divergence there then the other side of the battle carrier would be the akira class which unlike the sort of assault carriers focus far more on general space combat capabilities which is very much what the constellation actually focused on and providing that level of uh, long-range standoff support in space combat and that's something that the akira really does with its heavy torpedo capability it provides a very stable fire support platform using its torpedoes and its fighters in order to disrupt and attrit the enemy from a good distance so by having this large number of torpedoes and fighters, it's able to pose a twin threat to any enemy. And the enemy's then got to make a decision as to what particular threat they want to counter, whether that's torpedoes or whether that's fighters. And each one is going to you know, have its consequences. If you focus on dealing with the torpedo threat, maybe by closing down the Akira, pressuring it and bringing it into phaser range, you're going to put yourself at more risk of being attacked by fighters. If you try and focus on the fighters, you're going to just be unable to respond to the torpedo threat of the Akira. So that's really where you see battle carriers evolving to. Quote Ryan Macbeth, it's the creation of dilemmas for the enemy. Finally, that leads us to the last category, the supercarrier. 
the best example of which is the Cardassian Tornen class, which is arguably the first supercarrier that we see. The Tornen is capable of deploying an entire wing of fighters and bombers. That is incredibly destructive. It also has enough auxiliary bays to also support numerous smaller shuttlecraft and transport ships and, uh, and all the like. The price it pays for this capability is that it has minimal self-defense weapons. Its size is really the key. What makes the supercarrier work in this time period is its size. It's large enough that it can carry so many fighters that it doesn't actually need to worry about its own self-defense because it has enough offensive mass contained within it that it can just unleash its swarm of fighters and bombers and that will just demolish anything that tries to attack it. Now generally they will be escorted by destroyers or frigates they won't be left completely on their own but they very much rely on put all their eggs into the auxiliary craft basket unlike say the Akira which kind of hedges its bets the Tornen and other supercarriers fully commit to their role of carrying a very aggressive formation of fighters or other auxiliary ships. Now, what really makes the supercarrier work in this time period is the improvements in fighter technology. By the 24th century, or mid 24th century, fighters are now in a position where they are actually able to engage in large numbers, I must emphasize, enemy vessels. And this is very important because previously, enemy starships in the 23rd century could often just decline the engagement by fighters. And they would just be, the battle space was too large and the fighters would be too few to exert enough force of mass as compared to the 24th century where you're seeing, you know, whole wings of about 64 fighters barrel down on an enemy starship formation. That can do a lot of damage. You couldn't get that in the 23rd century. The ships weren't big enough and the ships also had the ability to just decline engagement just by using warp drive because most fighters of that period did not have any kind of warp drive or certainly not any warp drive to speak of, no nothing that would actually be useful. And so starships could just decline that engagement and even if they didn't, it would be very unlikely that you'd ever have enough fighters in enough concentration to actually do anything decisive. It's worth saying that the supercarrier concept was obviously successful because in the 25th century we will see the Jupiter class and the Klingon Vodovet Vo 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 The surprise Pikachu Klingon. It's very clear that this concept actually had some legs, not necessarily a dominant position, but enough to warrant further consideration. It's interesting you note the differences. The Jupiter class has a single large launch door through which you could put all sorts of large vessels. Whereas the Klingon derp face uh, has four shoulder mounted shell bays. So two sets on each side and then each split with a deck in the middle, which is quite interesting. That, that again breathes that idea of rapid launch and recovery, which is something you actually see on the Romulan de Duradex. So that's almost something. And that's something that the Romulan de Duradex actually took all the way from the Nova class, which was kind of playing again with that idea of how do you make auxiliary craft effective? How do you get them into action quite quickly? So this is something that it's worth saying, while actual full-on carriers are fairly rare in the Star Trek universe, the ideas behind them are being sort of toyed with quite a long way back, you know, so different ways of launching and recovering shuttles. You know, do we have a single large clamshell uh, launch bay? Do we have sort of B or starboard launch doors? Do we have a forward launch door? Do we just have them pop out of the surface? There's all sorts of different ways of launching and recovering auxiliary craft, and those do affect how they are employed and the doctrine behind them. So it's fair to say that actually in the Star Trek universe, carriers or carrier adjacent things, proto carriers, have always been operating in the periphery. They've always been there, sort of waiting for their chance. But ultimately, they end up living and dying by the technology of the time and by the auxiliary craft of the time. If the auxiliary craft of the time aren't all that useful, 
and don't have much of a niche, then chances are the carriers don't have that much of a niche. But they can adapt to suit circumstances, whether that's support carriers, which, you know, basically try to just form the backline and don't represent too much of a concentration of resources or firepower, or the battle carriers, which are a bit more aggressive, or the super carriers that exert large amounts of force projection. They all had their time and place in history and were, in many ways, in many little ways, quite instrumental in how those wars were fought and were difference makers, if not in actually destroying enemy ships, then in how they changed the battle space and how those that used them were able to better understand and exploit the battle space. So, where does this leave us with carriers going forward into the 25th century? Well, I don't see them becoming particularly dominant. Modern scale is what ultimately makes them viable. And they also have the ability to last far longer than similar sized capital ships, because unlike capital ships, which have to have very up-to-date armaments and have to have good speed and agility and shields and armor, carriers don't need any of those things. They just need the latest and greatest fighters. And if they have those, they can stick around for quite a while until they eventually, yeah, reach the end of their service life. But they are actually quite a long-lived type of vessel, as opposed to cruisers and battleships and all of that, which can actually fall out of favor, fall out of relevance quite quickly. So they aren't as vulnerable to the march of time as others. But equally, that same simplicity is also what holds them back and what prevents them from becoming dominant. Ultimately, the universe of Star Trek is one of starships, and that is not going to change. So because the fighter will never, will never be dominant, the carrier will also never become the symbol of strategic power that it is in our modern world. So those are my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. Let me know which is your favorite carrier. What is your preferred type of carrier? What do you think is a useful or interesting implementation of carrier? Let me know in the comments below, and I will see you all in the next video.